Hi there, it's Friday the 11th of January 2019. Happy New Year. Welcome to ITB, coming to today from New York City. Let's get started. Let me bring you up to date with what's happened in regard to digital taxation since the last ITB on the 21st of December. I'll start with France. You'll remember that the French government in the week of the 21st of December accelerated its timetable in regard to the introduction of a digital services tax. The acceleration was part of the revenue response to the yellow vest demonstrations. According to the government, the new tax would apply from the 1st of January 2019, with details to be released imminently. Well, that hasn't happened yet. And indeed, the Finance Law 2019, which Parliament has now passed, does not contain the provisions for the new tax. So both the announcement of the details and the parliamentary process to enact the tax have yet to occur. Next, Italy. You might remember that Italy included provisions for a web tax in its Budget Law 2018, which was enacted 12 months ago. However, that web tax was never made effective and the relevant provisions have now been repealed by Budget Law 2019, which was enacted at the end of December 2018. But included in the Budget Law 2019 is a new Digital Revenue Tax, DRT. Apparently, this is far more likely to be implemented. This new DRT is closely modelled on the original form of the EU's DST. Its rate will be 3% and it will apply to the same three types of revenue. Revenue from online advertising, revenue from online marketplaces and revenue from the transfer of user data. The Italian DRT will apply to both resident and non-resident companies which meet both of the revenue thresholds. Global group revenue of at least 750 million euros and group revenue from Italian digital services of at least 5.5 million euros. The expectation is that the government will issue an implementing decree for the DRT by the 30th of April 2019 and that the new tax would then be effective 60 days after publication of that decree. And in Austria, the government has announced that it will introduce a form of DST. The rate will be 3%, but the scope will be narrower than the original form of the EU DST. It will apply only to revenue from online advertising. In fact, the proposal is to amend the country's existing 5% advertising tax, which applies only to print and billboard advertising, by reducing the rate to 3% and expanding the scope to include online advertising. The revenue thresholds for the tax to apply are familiar global group revenue of at least 750 million euros and group revenue from Austrian advertising of at least 10 million euros. The government has stated that it will wait until the ECOFIN meeting in March to see whether the EU DST obtains unanimous support. If it doesn't, the government will then implement its proposal for the amended advertising tax. Tax havens, which the BEPS inclusive framework 
calls the no or only nominal tax jurisdictions seem to be falling over themselves to introduce an economic substance test. First, there was the Cayman Islands, which I covered in ITB on the 14th of December. Then there was BVI and now Bermuda. This really is a brave new world. If you want to study the relevant legislation and regulations in the three jurisdictions and see how closely they resemble each other, you can find them all at our website. I have two cases for you this week. The first is a decision of Finland's Supreme Administrative Court and it concerns transfer pricing. This has been called a landmark decision in Finland. From an international perspective, it's noteworthy in regard to the issue of whether updates to the OECD transfer pricing guidelines should be given retrospective effect and also the related issue of when the profit split method should be used. Here are the relevant facts. ACO, a Finnish resident company, is the parent of a European group which manufactures and sells insulation products. ACO enters into three types of cross-border related party transactions. The first type of transaction is the licensing of manufacturing IP. ACO licensed that IP to related party manufacturing companies in Finland, Poland, Sweden and Lithuania in return for royalties. ACO set and defended the royalty rates by applying the comparable uncontrolled price method. The second type of transaction is the sale of raw materials from ACO to the related party manufacturing companies in Finland, Poland, Sweden and Lithuania. ACO set and defended the sale price by applying the cost plus method. And the third type of transaction is the sale of finished goods from the manufacturing companies in Finland to related party sales companies in 13 European countries. The sale prices for these transactions were set and defended by the resale price method. The Finnish tax administration rejected ACO's use of the CUP cost plus and resale price methods. Instead, it concluded that the group's business operations were highly integrated and that the key profit driver was ACO's manufacturing IP. It therefore applied a residual profit split method. It allocated a routine return to each of the sales companies and manufacturing companies and then the residual group profit was allocated to ACO. An important point to note in this case is that the tax years in dispute were 2006 to 2008. This means that the version of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, which was current at the time ACO filed its tax returns for those years, was the 1995 version. The 1995 guidelines set a very high threshold for the use of the two profit-based methods, profit split and TNMM. Firstly, the 1995 guidelines indicate that a profit-based method should be used only in exceptional situations and cases of last resort. Paragraph 2.49 says this, Traditional transaction methods are the most direct means of establishing whether conditions in the commercial and financial relations between associated enterprises are arm's length. As a result, traditional transaction methods are preferable to other methods. 
However, the complexities of real life business situations may put practical difficulties in the way of the application of the traditional transaction methods. In those exceptional situations where there are no data available or the available data are not of sufficient quality to rely solely or at all on the traditional transaction methods, it may become necessary to address whether and under what conditions other methods may be used. And paragraph 3.50 states, there are, however, cases where traditional transaction methods cannot be reliably applied alone or exceptionally cannot be applied at all. These would be considered cases of last resort. Such cases arise only where there is insufficient data on uncontrolled transactions, possibly because of uncooperative behaviour on the part of the taxpayer relative to these guidelines, or where such data are considered unreliable or due to the nature of the business situation. In such cases of last resort, practical considerations may suggest application of a transactional profit split method, either in conjunction with traditional transaction methods or on its own. The 1995 guidelines also suggest that the profit split method should be used when transactions are very interrelated and they can't be evaluated on a separate basis. Paragraph 3.5 says this in the introduction to the profit split method. Where transactions are very interrelated, it might be that they cannot be evaluated on a separate basis. Under similar circumstances, independent enterprises might decide to set up a form of partnership and agree to a form of profit split. Accordingly, the profit split method seeks to eliminate the effect on profits of special conditions made or imposed in a controlled transaction, or in controlled transactions that are appropriate to aggregate under the principles of Chapter 1, by determining the division of profits that independent enterprises would have expected to realise from engaging in the transaction or transactions. Later versions of the OECD guidelines have reduced the threshold for the use of the profit-based methods. Firstly, the 2010 version of the guidelines deleted the references to exceptional situations and cases of last resort. However, they retained a clear preference for the traditional transaction methods, and in particular, the CUP method over the profit-based methods. And now the 2017 version of the guidelines, after the profit split update in 2018, has removed that preference for the traditional transaction methods. And the situations in which the profit split method should be used have been expanded in later versions of the guidelines. In the 2010 guidelines, there were two situations identified. Firstly, highly integrated operations. And secondly, where both parties make unique and valuable contributions. In the 2017 guidelines, after the 2018 update, a third situation has been added. Shared assumption of economically significant risks or separate assumption of closely related risks. Those guidelines also include a list of 16 examples of where the profit split method should or should not be used. Finland's Supreme Administrative Court held that the version of the guidelines which should govern this case is the version which was current at the time ACO filed its tax returns for the disputed tax years, 2006 to 2008. That was the 1995 version of the guidelines. 
This means that the official policy of the Finnish tax administration that changes to the guidelines have retrospective effect was rejected. And as you might expect, the court held that the tax administration had failed to satisfy the very high threshold which the 1995 guidelines establish for the use of profit-based methods. In particular, the court held that although ACO owned the manufacturing IP, this case was not an exceptional situation and the group transactions were not very interrelated. The court also held that it was possible for the tax administration to test ACO's use of the three traditional transaction methods and if necessary make adjustments to the comparables which ACO had used. And so the tax administration's use of the profit split method was rejected. The second case is the appeal decision in the GE Energy Parts case, recently delivered by the Delhi High Court. This decision is an appeal from the 2017 decision of the Delhi Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. And that was one of the most significant cases globally in 2017. Why do I say that? Because this case is a great illustration of what can go wrong in a multinational group in regard to the PE definition if the group does not strictly recognise the separate identity of legal entities. The case concerns the PE definition in Article 5 of the India-US Treaty. That definition is relevantly the same as the definition in the OECD Model Treaty before the 2017 update. However, the numbering is slightly different. To avoid confusion, I will use the numbering in the OECD model. The background to this case is that the Indian tax authorities had issued assessments to numerous non-resident companies within the GE group. These companies were tax resident in various countries, including the UK, Japan, the US, Canada, Italy, Mauritius and Singapore. The assessments claimed that the companies had PEs in India under the relevant double tax treaties. As the issues were the same with all the companies, the court focused on just one in this case, GE Energy Parts Inc, a US company, hence the India-US Treaty. The case concerns the activities of seven expatriate employees and their Indian support team. The expats were employed by various non-Indian companies within the GE group. However, it appears that the employer companies were not amongst the particular companies which had received assessments. The expats were seconded to India to fulfil the role of Indian country leader and other senior positions for various GE global business divisions. Their role was described in the Tribunal's 2017 decision in this way. These persons are working for various direct businesses of the GE Group in India, which are neither being conducted through a subsidiary or joint venture company. These persons are India head of different businesses and they are being supported by a team of persons who are employed by one of several Indian resident companies. The court looked first at Article 5.1, the fixed place of business PE. All of the seven expats and their Indian support team permanently worked at some office premises in New Delhi. Those office premises were officially occupied by the Indian liaison office of another US company within the GE group. Based on those facts, 
you can see that most of the conditions for an Article 51 PE were clearly satisfied in this case. There's a specific geographical place, the Liaison Office premises in New Delhi, which is at the disposal of the expats for a sufficiently long period of time. Only one further condition is required, and that's the tricky one, through which the business of the enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Which of course begs the question, which company is the enterprise? In 2017, the tribunal said this. The facts indicate two broader things. First, is that these expats worked in India for different business interests of GE Group, and their activities were not confined to the business of a particular entity. Second, is that they were heading the operation of GE overseas entities in India. From the facts, it is crystal clear that the expats were India country heads or working at the top positions, managing the business, securing orders and doing everything possible that could be done here in regard to the Indian operations of GE overseas entities in India. It has nowhere been denied, and rightly so, that the business model and role of the expats is similar in regard to all the businesses in India. This view is further strengthened from the fact that the expats were not confined to a particular GE entity, but working for one of its three major business lines, namely infrastructure, industrial and healthcare. And so the tribunal in 2017 held that the seven expats and their Indian support team were carrying on the business in India of each of the non-resident companies which had received assessments, including GE Energy Parts Inc. And therefore, according to the tribunal, each of those companies would have an Article 51 PE at the Liaison Office premises in New Delhi, subject to the preparatory or auxiliary exception in Article 54, which I will consider in a moment. Interestingly, the taxpayers appear to have effectively conceded this point in the Delhi High Court appeal. The court noted that the taxpayers did not make any new submissions on this point, and the court therefore adopted the tribunal's conclusion. But the taxpayers did make submissions on the preparatory or auxiliary exception in Article 54E. The key argument was that the seven expats and the Indian support team were merely liaising with prospective customers in India. Such activity is not part of the core activities in the business of any of the non-resident companies, and therefore it is of a preparatory or auxiliary character. That argument was rejected by the court. It is clear that in the kind of activity that GE carries out, that is, manufacture and supply of highly specialised and technically customised equipment, the core activity of developing the customer, identifying a client, approaching that customer, communicating the available options, discussing technical and financial terms of the agreement, even price negotiations, needed a collaborative process in which the potential client along with the seven expats and their Indian support team, had to intensely negotiate the intricacies of the technical and commercial parameters of the articles. This also involved discussing the contractual terms and the associated consideration payable, the warranty and other commercial terms. No doubt at later stages of contract negotiations, the India office could not take a final decision, but had to await the final word from headquarters. 
But that did not mean that the India office was just for mute data collection and information dissemination. The discharge of vital responsibilities relating to finalisation of commercial terms, or at least a prominent involvement in the contract finalisation process, was not a preparatory or auxiliary activity. And so the court concluded that the preparatory or auxiliary exception in Article 5.4e was not satisfied, and therefore all of the non-resident companies had Article 5.1 PEs in India. The Indian tax authorities had also taken the view that the seven expats and their Indian support team caused the non-resident companies to have Article 5.5 contract concluding dependent agent PEs in India. It was accepted by the court that the seven expats and their Indian support team participated in contract negotiations with the customers, but they did not conclude contracts with the customers in a way that made the contracts legally binding on the non-resident companies. Nevertheless, the court determined that the concludes contracts test was satisfied because of the participation in important parts of the negotiation process. In doing so, the court rejected the relevant part of the OECD commentary and found support in the 2002 Italian Supreme Court decision in the Philip Morris case. The court said this, the court notices that since the OECD commentary appears to be contradictory across paragraphs 32 and 33, it cannot be relied upon wholly. The term authority to conclude does not mean all elements and details, since that would make other portion of the clause redundant. Therefore, it only means that the activity needs to be core in nature. This is the opinion in Philip Morris. The participation of representatives or employees of a resident company in a phase of the conclusion of a contract between a foreign company and another resident entity may fall within the concept of authority to conclude contracts in the name of the foreign company. As a comment, I would say that I don't agree with this Article 5.5 analysis, and therefore I would like to see the Article 5.5 ground go on appeal to the Indian Supreme Court. However, I think that's unlikely to happen. The Article 5.1 and 5.4 analysis, in my view, is correct, and that would mean that Article 5.5 is moot. The final point in the case concerns the calculation of the profits attributable to the PEs under Article 7 of the various treaties. The tribunal had decided in favour of the global apportionment method, which has been used in India for a number of years, following the Rolls-Royce case in 2007. The court agreed with the tribunal's decision and application of this method. For a copy of the court's decision, please go to our website. In India, nothing is ever simple. A good example is the GST system. There are seven GST rates for goods. 0, 0 0.5, 3, 5, 12, 18 and 28. And there are five GST rates for services. 0, 5, 12, 18 and 28. The good news is that there's currently a national debate in India on simplifying, to some extent, this complex rate structure. Towards that objective, some decisions were made by the GST Council in late December. For a copy of the two relevant notices, 
please go to our website. And now for some more good news, this time on global trade, but not in regard to China or the US. The EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, a significant free trade agreement between two major participants in global trade, will enter into force on the 1st of February 2019. For information about this agreement, please go to our website. Korea has enacted its 2019 tax reform legislation. Here are the items which caught my eye. The domestic law definition of permanent establishment has been amended to align with the definition in the 2017 OECD model treaty, which reflects the BEPS changes. The annual cap on the utilisation of carried forward tax losses for Korean branches of non-resident companies has been reduced from 80% to 60% of taxable income. There are two changes to the treatment of Overseas Investment Vehicles, OIVs, which are in receipt of Korean sourced income. One change is in regard to whether the OIV is recognised as a corporation for Korean tax purposes, and the other is in regard to whether the OIV is considered to be the beneficial owner of the income. And this is an interesting one. Under current law, there's a provision which says that classification of income under a double tax treaty takes priority over the classification of the income for domestic law purposes. Well, that provision has now been repealed. I can foresee an expansion of the cases where the Korean tax authorities assert that the other income article applies to income derived by companies, rather than the business profits article. And also in Korea, the government has announced an expansion of the types of derivatives which are subject to capital gains tax, effective the 1st of April 2019. The European Commission has announced that it has launched an in-depth state aid investigation into tax rulings issued by the Netherlands to Nike. The Commission's concern is that royalty payments endorsed by the rulings may not reflect economic reality. In other words, the focus will again be on transfer pricing. For a copy of the Commission's press release, please go to our website. And also in regard to state aid, the European Commission has invited Italy and Spain to change their tax laws to ensure that ports, effective from the 1st of January 2020, pay corporate income tax in the same way as other companies in those two member states. This invitation is a preliminary step before the Commission launches an in-depth state aid investigation. This level of politeness is due to the fact that the two tax regimes existed prior to the entry into force of the EU treaty in the two member states. For a copy of the Commission's press release, please go to our website. In the Netherlands, the government has published a list of low-tax jurisdictions for use with a number of new or proposed tax rules. The new CFC rules following the implementation of ATAD 1, the new rulings practice, and the proposed withholding tax on certain outbound interest and royalty payments to be introduced in 2021. There are 16 jurisdictions on the list. One of them, the Cayman Islands, has gone ballistic. The Prime Minister issued a statement which says in part, the Cayman Islands government regrets the unjustified blacklisting and rejects it as wholly lacking in fairness and credibility. It is unfortunate 
that the Netherlands has chosen to attempt to divert criticism of its own tax practices by attacking the legitimate tax regimes of other jurisdictions. For a copy of the Prime Minister's statement, please go to our website. And in the UK, the tax authorities have released updated guidance in regard to the diverted profits tax. One interesting addition is in regard to royalty withholding tax. If withholding tax would have applied to royalty payments made by a UK actual PE after the law was strengthened in 2016, then royalty payments made by a UK deemed PE after the 27th of June 2016 will be included in the DPT tax base. For a copy of the updated guidance, please go to our website. And speaking of the DPT, the UK Revenue Authorities have launched a new disclosure facility called the Profit Diversion Compliance Facility. According to the information released by the government, HMRC is introducing a new Profit Diversion Compliance Facility for MNEs using arrangements targeted by DPT to give them the opportunity to bring their UK tax affairs up to date. For a copy of the information released by the government, please go to our website. In Botswana, income tax law amendments have been enacted. Most notably, a BEPS Action 4 interest deduction limitation will be introduced, with the cap set at 30% of EBITDA. Excess interest can be carried forward for three years, or 10 years in the case of mining and prospecting companies. Also, the amendments introduce a transfer pricing regime. And in Tunisia, Finance Law 2019 has been enacted. There's a couple of interesting points. There's no change in the standard corporate income tax rate, 25%. However, effective from the 1st of January 2021, a reduced rate of 13.5% will apply to a range of industries, from manufacturing of aircraft, ships, medical equipment, textiles, plastic products and footwear, to call centres, data processing and international trading companies. Secondly, banks, insurance companies, telecom companies and oil and gas companies will be subject to a 1% exceptional social security contribution on turnover, effective the 1st of January 2020. In Azerbaijan, the corporate income tax law has been amended, effective the 1st of January 2019. The only item which caught my eye is the introduction of a thin capitalisation rule to restrict deductions for interest expense. The maximum debt to equity ratio will be 2 to 1. This new rule won't apply to banks and other credit institutions. In Bahrain, the regulations for VAT have been released. For a copy of the regs, please go to our website. In Israel, the tax authorities have issued letters to companies advising them to amend their prior year income tax returns in order to reflect the April 2018 Supreme Court decisions in the Conterra and Finisar cases. These decisions held that the cost of stock options must be included in the cost base for transfer pricing purposes for companies which provide related party contract R&D services. 
the cost base is used in the application of the TNMM method. In Jordan, the tax law has been amended effective the 1st of January 2019. I noted four important changes. Firstly, in regard to corporate income tax rates. Jordan's income tax law currently provides for different tax rates for companies in different economic sectors. For two of those sectors, firstly industrial, pharmaceutical and clothing activities, and secondly all other industrial activities, the 2018 rate of 14% will be gradually increased over six years to 20% in 2024. The second important change is the introduction of a new national contribution tax, which will be imposed in addition to corporate income tax. The new national contribution tax will be imposed on taxable income at rates from 1% to 7%, depending on the company's economic sector. Thirdly, a thin cap rule will be introduced to restrict income tax deductions for interest expense. The debt to equity limit will be 3 to 1, applicable only to related party debt. And fourth, there will be a deemed Jordanian source for income from the electronic trade in goods or services with Jordanian persons, presumably subject to treaty benefits. And in the UAE, the tax authorities have issued guidance on VAT input tax apportionment. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website. In Argentina, the government has published the detailed implementation decree for the 2017 tax reform legislation. I've noted these items. In regard to the indirect transfer of assets or shares, the decree provides for exemption if the transfer is within an economic group, which requires a direct or indirect ownership of at least 80% for the two years prior to the transfer. The decree provides rules on how to identify tax havens, but it does not contain a list of jurisdictions. For the domestic law PE definition, agents with a significant role in the negotiation of contracts will create a PE. Surprisingly, the BEPS Action 4 cap on interest deductions, which is set at 30% of EBITDA, does not apply to interest which is subject to withholding tax, even if the withholding tax is reduced or exempted under a treaty. And the decree provides guidelines for the application of the substance requirements under the CFC rules. Also in Argentina, the government has introduced an export duty on the export of services, applicable for two years from the 1st of January 2019. The duty rate is 12%, but the quantum is capped to four Argentine pesos for every US dollar of the value of the exported services. The government has previously stated that it recognises the lack of economic logic for this new tax, but it needs the revenue. In Colombia, the finance bill has been enacted. There are several important changes. Most notably, the corporate income tax rate will be progressively reduced from 33% in 2019 to 30% in 2022. Indirect transfers of Colombian shares or assets will be subject to capital gains tax, which can be collected from a subordinate Colombian company. The thin cap rules have been changed from a 3 to 1 debt to equity cap to 2 to 1, 
but still only applicable to related party debt. There is a general increase in withholding tax rates. However, there's no change in the standard rate of VAT, which remains at 19%. In Mexico, the government has introduced tax incentives for businesses operating in the northern border zone. For the 2019 and 2020 years, companies will enjoy a reduced effective income tax rate of 20% instead of the usual 30% and a reduced effective VAT rate of 8% instead of the usual 16%. For a copy of the government's decree, please go to our website. In Peru, the government has issued a decree on the thin cap rules and the indirect share transfer rules. In regard to the thin cap rules, the debt to equity cap of 3 to 1, which previously applied only to related party debt, has been extended to all debt. The decree sets out the formula for calculating the amount of disallowed interest. The indirect share transfer rules automatically apply if certain valuation thresholds are met. The decree sets out the relevant calculation procedures. For a copy of the decree, please go to our website. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had two treaties signed, nine treaties enter into force, one protocol enter into force, and two treaties terminated. I have three articles for you this week. The first is called Profit Splitting and the Aspirational Arms Length Standard. It's the editorial in the November 2018 Intertax Journal and it's written by Anna Paula Dorado. The article reviews a number of current challenges to the traditional interpretation and paramount force of the arms length principle. The first challenge is the transformation of the arm's length principle where comparability has traditionally been critical into a results-oriented principle. The author sees the US Court of Appeals decision in July 2018 in the Altera case as an illustration of this transformation. As you know, due to the death of one of the judges, that decision has been set aside and the case is currently being reheard. Nevertheless, the author sees the court's acceptance of the validity of the US cost sharing regulations in regard to employee stock options in the context where there is no evidence that unrelated parties would enter into such transactions as an important acknowledgement of this transformation. An interesting point made by the author is that although the OECD transfer pricing guidelines allow the profit split method to be used in situations where comparables cannot be found, there has been no amendment of Article 9.1 of the OECD model treaty to clarify that a results-oriented approach is permitted. The second challenge identified by the author is in regard to the paramount force of the arm's length principle. Here she refers to the May 2018 decision of the European Court of Justice in the hornbach baumarkt case. In that case, the court held that Germany's transfer pricing rules can be restricted by the EU's freedom of establishment. The second article is called Fiscal State Aid and Tax Treaty Law. 
the puzzling decision in the McDonald's case. It's written by Jerome Monsenego and it's published in the Kluwer Competition Law blog. You'll remember that in December 2018, the European Commission released the non-confidential version of its reasoned decision concerning the Luxembourg tax rulings issued to McDonald's. The rulings concerned the receipt of royalties by the US branch of a Luxembourg company. I covered this story in ITB on the 21st of December. Well, the author finds the analysis in the Commission's document puzzling in several ways. Let me give you a good example. You remember that the basis of the tax planning is that Luxembourg considers the US branch to be a PE under the definition in Article 5 of the Luxembourg-US Treaty. This means that, in Luxembourg's view, the US is entitled to impose tax on the profits attributable to the PE. And therefore, Luxembourg is obliged to exempt those profits from Luxembourg tax under the Relief from Double Taxation article, which is Article 25 in the Treaty. Well, the author views the Commission's analysis of whether the branch truly was a PE as inadequate. He writes this, The ruling concluded to the existence of a PE under Luxembourg law, which would legitimate the exemption method. In this respect, it is surprising that the Commission did not analyse more in depth this point in light of the state aid rules. There seems to be arguments that could at least question this conclusion. For example, the US branch had no employees, point 22 of the decision. And from a US perspective, it was considered that the primary business was not conducted through the branch, point 40, which means that the branch might only conduct secondary activities, leading to the lack of trade or business in the US. Is that not an indication of a potential activity that is preparatory or auxiliary? Article 54E of the US Luxembourg Treaty included a provision stating that the maintenance of a fixed place of business solely for the purpose of carrying on for the enterprise any other activity of a preparatory or auxiliary character does not constitute a PE. This exception was potentially valid here, in which case the decision on the existence of a PE could violate the treaty because the treaty requires the application of the exemption method only if income may be taxed in the US in accordance with the provisions of the Convention, Article 25.2a of the Treaty. Finding a PE, although it falls under the exception for auxiliary activities, and granting an exemption could then constitute a selective advantage. And the third article is called New UK Tax on Overseas Intangibles. The article is written by Eloise Walker and it's published in Bloomberg's Daily Tax Report International. The article makes a series of points in regard to the new UK income tax charge on offshore receipts in respect of intangible property which was announced in the 2018 UK budget and which I covered in ITB on the 2nd and the 9th of November. Here's an example of a situation where the new income tax charge would apply to the royalties, the so-called UK derived amounts received by ACO from BCO. But the charge won't be levied if an exemption applies. The legislation contains four exemptions, one of which relates to the level of foreign tax which is paid by ACO on its royalty income. 
specifically if the foreign tax suffered in relation to the UK derived amounts is at least 50% of the UK income tax which would apply under the so-called operative provision. Well, in the article, the author makes the very important point that this exemption will usually involve a comparison of a net figure with a gross figure. The foreign tax will usually be imposed on a net basis, but the UK income tax charge will be 20% on the gross UK derived amounts which would make it unlikely that this exemption will be satisfied. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 11th of January, 2019. I'm Steve Towers in New York. Have a great weekend.